ICQ Podcast episode 397, 23 Sims Antenna Review. Well, hello and welcome, fellow Amateur Radio enthusiasts, to this our 397th episode of the ICQ Amateur Radio Podcast. Supported this episode by our monthly and subscription donors. In this episode, we join Martin, M1MRB, along with Dan, Kilo Bravo 6, November Uniform, Ed, Mike Zero, Sierra, November Golf, Ed Durant, DD5, Lima Papa, and Chris, Mike Zero, Tango, Charlie Hotel, to discuss the latest Amateur Radio News. Myself, Colin, M6BOA, rounds up the news in brief. And in this episode's feature, we have a double feature for you, which is a 23 SEMS antenna review along with ISP troubles. That might uh, it's a point in the direction if you're changing your internet service provider. As mentioned, our uh, show today is brought to you by our monthly and subscription donors who continue to help us out by paying their way, uh, by showing the value of what we do and say helping us keep ourselves advert free. It's a very, very simple process we ask for here. If you find value from today's show, we ask you to visit www.icqpodcast.com uh, forward slash donate. And from there, you can select one of our pre-options or an open option for yourself that you can send a donation our way and help us out. So say, so guys, we hope, we hope you uh, get something from today's show and uh, consider us in that way. Right, well, now we're going to visit the guys. We're going to talk about the uh, latest uh, news and generate thoughts about uh, what's going on in our hobby. So we join Martin, Dan, Edmund, Ed and Chris as they discuss news stories including balloons and expansions on solar cycle predictions. As always, I hope you enjoy. Whether it's across the pond or over the channel, the ICQ podcast is international. Herzlich willkommen in Deutschland. Good evening. 73 de España. Atenta. By amateurs. For amateurs. Well, hi guys. Welcome to this episode of the ISQ podcast, episode 397. And tonight's news roundtable for that episode. Tonight, I'm joined by Mr. Dan Romacek, KB6NU. Hi, Dan. Hi, guys. Nice to be here again. It's great to have you as always. Uh, down on the south coast from me, we have Mr. Edmund Spicer, M0MMG. Hello, Martin. Hello, everybody. Yeah, you're with us. That's good. Uh, in Germany, we have Mr. Ed Durant, DD5LP. Good evening, everybody. Yeah, good evening, Ed. And last but not least, and really by uh, very short notice, Mr. Chris Howard's joined us, M0TCH. Hi, Chris. Good evening, guys, and apologies in advance. I've done none of the notes for this, so I'm very much flying my to my pants, but uh, I'm sure it'll be fine. Yeah, I'm sure you will. And unfortunately, Karen couldn't join us tonight for family reasons, uh, but she is perfectly okay, and she'll be back with us on the next episode. So uh, and, uh, we wish you all the best there. Okay, let's look at our first news story. And, oh, where, where are we going to go with this? Uh, our first news story, spy radio stations that still broadcast today. And this was a nice little um, interesting one, I thought, of talking about the number stations in the 70s and some of them are still going today. Dan. This was, uh, I think, uh, published your side of the pond originally. What do you think? Well, you know, I, I've heard number stations on eight, both 80 meters and 30 meters, and they were sending in Morse code. And, you know, I, I think they're, they're still around. I mean, what, you know, why wouldn't they? There's, there's still a pretty secure way of sending messages, you know, with these, uh, the codes. They're virtually uncrackable. And, you know, uh, I don't know. I guess I would say if I was in the spy business, I'd say, why not? Well, uh, you know, as you say, they're virtually uncrack uncrackable. I mean, we know this from World War II and Bletchley Park, that codes can be cracked. Um, and uh, it's the processing speed now. We have far bigger processes to do that sort of stuff. But I'd still suggest it will take a good few days sometimes to crack some of this. So. Uh, yeah, good one. Edmund, what's your thoughts? Well, I've never 
really gone out of my way to listen for number stations, so I've not heard that many of them. Usually, you would expect to find them between about 3 and 12 megahertz, and usually outside of broadcast and amateur bands, but as Dan has just mentioned, not always. Are they still on air, undoubtedly? And if they are still on air, that must mean it's worth the time and effort and electricity bill to run them, because I can't imagine they'd be cheap in terms of infrastructure, transmitter maintenance, mass maintenance, and all that kind of thing. And despite the sophistication of the modern world, things that are simple and as simple as possible will often tend to be the things that work the best. So if you're a spy and you're going through airport security and you've got a radio in your briefcase, nobody's really going to bat an eyelid and chances are anybody on airport security these days, if they see a radio, they'll just think, oh, FM or DAB, music, entertainment, that sort of thing. It's unlikely that anybody will look closely enough to see that your radio covers shortwave and possibly SSB as well, although I think most number stations transmit using a good old amplitude modulation. So it's virtually untraceable unless the, the authorities actually put their hand on your shoulder whilst you're tuned into one of these broadcasts. Nobody can trace you receiving it, and if you're using a one-time pad, then it's virtually unbreakable, and it's not reliant on having a working internet or cell phone coverage or a memory stick, say, that you could have physically intercepted and uh, have your cover broken. So yes, undoubtedly they're still on the air and all of this stuff still goes on. And uh, if number stations are something that interests you, if you have a look at the Ringway Manchester uh, YouTube channel, uh, Lewis Mike 3 Hotel Hotel Yankee has uh, released a number of short YouTube films. Well, they're almost like mini documentaries, actually on uh, number stations in the last month or two. So those are well worth a look, as are pretty much any video on any subject that uh, Lewis publishes on his YouTube channel. Back to you, Martin. Yeah, no problems at all. Well, to say there are uh, opportunities that you could, well, we know that uh, super hat receivers do tend to radiate a little bit, but they wouldn't go far. So you could get tracked, but then you've got a. It, there's just so s- such a hit and miss to find it. That sort of thing. I, I would suggest you know millions of people in an area trying to dip direction find you on a very weak signal with everything else. As you say, have been pretty much not a chance of being caught listening unless they stumble across you by accident. Ed, what's your thoughts? Yeah, I just echo what everybody else has said. The old technology still works. And the the article covers some of the uh, messages that the, uh, the U.S. managed to decode going to Cuban spies in the U.S. When was that? In 1998, uh, various messages about it. And they said the guy who wrote this article, Colin, Colton Cruiser, said his favorite was when the uh, Cuban government sent out the message Congratulate all female comrades for International Day of Women. Uh, women, <laughs> that was right—a nice touch. So, uh, yeah, I mean, it, you can't block radio waves. Uh, you can try to interfere with them, but you can't physically put a wall in between them and stop them getting into a country. Whereas internet, you can. Um, obviously, physical movement of anything, you can. Telephone calls, you can, you can monitor, you can block, but uh, radio, you can't. And, you know, if there's a spy somewhere and he needs to monitor this stuff, he, he can probably go down the street and buy a shortwave radio from a shop down in the high street. Uh, he doesn't even have to bring it into the country with him. So, uh, you know, this has been going on from just after the, well, between the First and the Second World Wars. 
up to the present day. And, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting that it's still going. And apparently many of them are now on sideband, but one of them went back to AM, or, or several of them are on sideband, and one of them actually went back to AM, which, of course, maybe be because it's easier to get a hold of an AM shortwave broadcast receiver than one that will um, decode sideband. So, yeah, obviously still uh, a very valid communications method, if only one way. It certainly is, Ed, certainly is. And I'd be devastated that I've got a Sony shortwave receiver. Well, it's it's a pocket radio. It does the VHF broadcast band, and it does all the HF bands. Uh, with upper and lower sideband as well as AM. So I'd be devastated if I lost that, but you, I could probably pick a lot of that up on that. But uh, there you go. Chris, have we left you anything to say on this one? Not a huge amount. Um, I was just going to add in around the, the encryption. So, yeah, when one-time pads, is, I believe it's pretty much unbreakable, no matter how much computing power you've got, because the codes only, you only ever use once. Um, so... In terms of the, it is pretty secure, and as you were saying, I think everyone said pretty much that it's uh, very hard to track someone down. Uh, you know, trans- you know, transmitting on the short waves. There is the famous, I think it's, well, we think you were caught a number station EVB seventy six, the the buzzer it's sometimes called, which come, we believe comes out of Russia, which is going all the time. And you know, I can pick it up quite easily here, which uh, just sends out a buzzing signal every second or so, and. I've never heard it myself, but I believe there are voices, Russian voices and things that heard on that. So I presume that's some kind of marker frequent, you know, on the frequency to say, you know, I'm still, I'm still here. And um, I believe there are sometimes when people start talking on those, on that frequency, presumably in numbers and things to, uh, to, to who knows, to who knows who, no doubt in some sort of coded format. So, um, yeah, but not much else to say more on this one, no. Yeah, well, as I say, just a nice little interesting one because this has been around for a long time. Us amateurs have hear them every now and again, and we just thought we'd throw this one in as a as a bit of fun. But you know, I, as you say, they're using the kiss principle, and they keep it s- simple, stupid. You know, it's uh, if AM and SSB work for them, why wouldn't you? And, uh, yeah, I know that a lot of shortwave stations have gone off the air, but I suppose you could hijack it up. Well, no. If you're a government, you just tell one of the shortwave stations you want to borrow their transmitter for half an hour every day or something, or half an hour a week, and uh, just change the frequency. What what would we know, you know, and keep changing it? Let's say it would depend on the country, obviously. Right, moving to our next news story. An expansion on the solar cycle prediction. Now, when I look back at uh, uh, previous episodes, and I, it's around about 332, I think it was, ICQ 332, I managed to interview Mr. Scott McIntosh with uh, our presenter, Frank, and, uh, and the episode went out on the 30th of August, 2020, saying that, this was going to be a, a really, really good sunspot cycle, or cycle 25 is actually going to be really, really good. And looks like they're now actually agreeing with uh, Ms. Uh, Dr. Scott McIntosh because uh, this one's going to be a good one. Ed, do you want to go first on this one? Yeah, I will do. Yeah, as, as you said, Martin, um, Scott McIntosh and his team have done a lot of work into why the propagation changes over the period of time, and uh, Frank detailed some of this in an article he wrote on it as well, with the approval of Scott. And it was just a case that, you know, 90% of the uh, people were saying, no, 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 uh, solar cycle 25 is going to be about the same, perhaps even worse than 24 we're not going to see another big solar cycle with uh, good radio conditions for uh, quite a long time to come. And the article with the link in the in the show notes uh, was actually from spaceweatherlive.com. And in there, if you go through it, there's the uh, graphs of the predictions, both from the, uh, if you like, the old school NASA and NOAA and also the predictions from Scott McIntosh's group 
and the actual readings of where the sunspots and the SFI is and has been going and the way it is trending. And indeed, it certainly at the moment seems to be showing that uh, Scott McIntosh's predictions are nearer to the truth of what's actually coming. We're already far exceeded the maximum that the NOAA and well, not far exceeded, but exceeded, Uh, what the NOAA and NASA people predicted based on statistics. Uh, So, yeah, good on on Scott. It looks like we're in for a very nice three or four years of really good conditions on the HF bands. So uh, people are thinking about getting onto the HF bands from, uh, from VHF. Now would certainly be the time to do it. If you're thinking to put up an antenna, now's the time to do it and uh, enjoy the next few years over to you martin yeah yeah certainly you will enjoy the next few years chris i know that we're lucky to have frank to give us this talk uh, in a month or so's time as well aren't we so uh it yeah, it's a shame cool. frank's not on tonight's episode really because this would have been good to get his his views on this but uh, yeah we've got frank kind of doing a talk for us on this exact subject uh, next month for the club so uh Looking forward to that one. But no, not much more to one. I think the other guys have uh, covered this one pretty much. Yeah, that's a good one. Now, Edmund, you have been enjoying the uh, the sunspot site at the increased propagation, haven't you? I know you have. Yes, and I can certainly bear out that uh, things are on the up just purely in terms of what I've been receiving. I don't tend to turn the radio on on any given day when there's good figures i just turn the radio on whenever i have an opportunity or whenever i have a spare half an hour and if conditions are good bad or indifferent on any given band then i just go with it you know i, I do things that way around but last weekend the weekend before the podcast was released i had a listen on um, 12 metres using an an antenna that is nowhere near resonant on that frequency. And not only was the entire band virtually rammed with signals, most of them were 5.9 or 5.9 plus. So if I'd been feeding my transceiver with anything like a resonant antenna, goodness knows how strong they would have been. So, yeah, from my my rather uh, infrequent (laughs) observations, yeah, the conditions are are definitely improving. And I can even listen to the New York repeater Kilo Quebec 2 Hotel on 29.620 most afternoons, sometimes in the late morning as well, just using a a scanner and a a, a 10 meter length of coax with a 70 centimeter Yagi on top. Um, Okay. It's probably the coax that's acting as the antenna and the, the Yagi looks like a capacity hat um, at that frequency. But even so uh, through a, a setup as rudimentary as that, the New York repeater wouldn't be any stronger at my location if it was located in the next street. So yeah. Good times ahead, Martin, like you say. Yeah, I know you were pretty excited about it when I spoke to you the other week about all the things you were doing. So that's a good one. Dan, are you finding the the same at the moment with propagation? Oh, yeah, this this has been great. Uh, I'm I'm really enjoying this a lot. And, you know, I'm really sorry now that I didn't put up a better antenna for the the upper bands um, uh, last summer. I'm, I'm going to have to really work on doing that this year. I'll just, I'll just recall, though, uh, I don't know if you guys remember this, but you know when we were in sort of the depths of the last cycle, there was a lot of talk about that we were entering another maunder minimum. And uh, I, I can only say that I'm glad that, that those predictions didn't uh, turn out to be true. I agree, I agree 100% with you, Dan. I mean, you know, we've had a, we've had a good innings on this, I think. And you know, if got Macintosh's predictions and uh, are accepted by everybody going forward, or certainly looked at the, uh, the predictions over the next few uh, cycles, 
I think um, things could be on the up. You know, I know there'll be, be bad su- sunspot cycles at times, but this one is a real good one. So, uh, yeah, I'm glad everybody's enjoying themselves. Right. Well, another club that's done become 100 years old. Uh, Ed, you sent this one to me. They're a station in VK uh, down yeah. there in Australia, and uh, you spotted 100 years. That's pretty damn good going, isn't it? Yeah, actually, on the day that this podcast will be released, on the 26th, the Manly Warringah Radio Society, which are in one of the major clubs in Sydney in Australia, uh, will be 100 years old, and they will be celebrating the whole year. Last week, uh, sorry, not last week, two weeks ago, the last edition of ICQ podcast, I think we had a, a piece on a US club that's 100 years old this year. Um, so, uh, just a call out to any of the listeners, if your club or you know of a club that's going to be a hundred years old, uh, in the UK, in Germany, in France, wherever, um, in the US, in Australia, whatever, why don't just send us a note through about it, uh, into, uh, by the website and let us know what that club's doing, especially to celebrate the, uh, the hundred years. I'm trying to see here what uh, what Manly Ringer are doing. I read this before. I can't remember now. I believe they're getting a special event call sign. So that'll be uh, something on the air from their side. And uh, they're planning several... Uh, oh, yes, here we are. VI100MB. Uh, in Australia, special event call signs use VI, uh, like GB in the UK, uh, 100 for 100 years, and MB for... Mer- Mer- yeah, try again. Why, why MB for Manly Waringa? No, oh, well, never mind. It is MB anyway. Yeah, and they're also going to have some special events during the uh, during the year at the club rooms, etc. So this hobby of ours has been going a while, and uh, it's really great to hear that there's so many clubs that have lasted a hundred years. I mean, that for any in any hobby, any organisation lasting a hundred years, that's that's something to be celebrated. And Richard VK2SKY is arranging things down in Australia. Back to you, Martin. Yeah, yeah. That, I mean, 100 years is a good one. And uh, as you say, it'd be nice. Uh, I know we're not quite there, but uh, we're getting there. Edmund, your thoughts on 100 years? Well, 100 years of anything is um, a heck of an achievement. So very many congratulations to the Radio Club. And here's to the next 100. And I'm really pleased to hear Ed say the name of that location because I've wondered a few times down the years how to cor- correctly pronounce that uh, location. I'm not going to try it myself, incidentally. Uh, the reason the name sounds familiar is that there is an excellent video on YouTube that was, was uploaded probably the best part of a, a decade ago now where a group of people from that location put a local lighthouse on the air for the International Lighthouse Lightship Weekend. I don't know if it was the club that we're talking about here who are responsible for that activation, or if it was just a a group of local amateurs who... No, it it was the club. Oh, it was? It it was, definitely, yeah. They they get into a lot of that thing. They're, They're one of the larger clubs in Sydney. Uh, on the North Shore, Manly, and yeah, they get a lot into yeah portable events, portable activations, and yeah, the uh, the lighthouse. That I think that I don't think they've missed a year of that for probably ten or fifteen years at least. So yeah, it's the same people you're thinking about. Well, again, I, I mentioned earlier that some of Ringway Manchester's YouTube videos are, are more like mini documentaries rather than just your average. YouTube video. So, um, if you have even the slightest interest in uh, lighthouses or the lightship weekend, that particular one from about ten years ago is well worth a watch. And and how do you pronounce that location properly, Ed? Go on, say it again. Manly Waringa, and Waringa, I'm guessing, comes from an Aboriginal name for the uh, probably for the location. So, Waring Waringa is the second half of it. Manly, you know. Um, that's easy. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a good one. 
Dan, what's your thoughts on this? I mean, another club, 100 years, got to be good, isn't it? Oh, yeah. You know, I love all this uh, amateur radio history. And so, you know, 100 years, that's, a, that's that, you know, that's really an accomplishment. You know, you, you're involved with the club, Martin. You should know. It's, it's really hard to keep a club together and keep it active. And, you know, it sounds like these uh, folks in Australia are just, uh, I mean, that's the secret to their success. They're always doing stuff. So, you know, other clubs maybe can take a, take a lesson from that. Yeah, well, I am, as you say, involved with another club. Well, I'm involved with Sutton and Cheam, obviously, the uh, Radio Society. But I'm also involved in the club or family of the ICQ podcast because I do feel we're like a bit of – well, I remember our listeners sometimes think we're, we're a closed club, and I always think this is a big family. So it's, I enjoy it and the hobby, and you're right. Will the ICQ ever make it to 100 years? <laughs> We're coming up to 15, but I don't think I'll be around for the 100-year episode. Hi, <laughs> hi. Oh, dear. Chris, what do you think? Well, yeah, I mean, 100 years is, is fantastic. Uh, just think about the, the changes in that time. 100 years ago, I'd imagine there'd be an awful lot of people having to make their own equipment and... Uh, and really experiment Spark, yeah. nowadays, things have probably, yeah, exactly. And I guess things, you know, look at the modes that have changed. We've got SSB, we've got digital modes. The technology has changed, but we still, we can still do it the old way. We can now do it the new way. Just looking at our club, we were, Chutton and we were founded in 1946. We've got a 21 year, no, no, that's not true, is it? 20 odd years to go until we, until we hit the hundred. But, um, but yeah, it, you know, great thing to have, uh, to have achieved. And it's a lot of hard work to keep the club, clubs going over that amount of time. So, uh, yeah, congratulations to these guys. That's uh, a big achievement. Yeah, certainly is, certainly is. And in fairness, uh, good on them. I'm, I'm obviously impressed. And you know, long live the hobby and long live the clubs. So uh, there we go. Okay, move to our next news story. Frank got all excited about this the other week, and our Frank uh, K4 over uh, FMH, Mr. Frank Hal, and he sent me. Um, a link to a post he put on his own website. And it's talking about uh, GMRS radio in the States. And he's saying there are almost as many GM GMRS uh, license holders as there are technician license holders in the States, which is you know, quite a high number. And Frank um, obviously likes statistics, and there were pretty pictures, and hopefully we'll get them on our website as well showing uh, various bits and pieces but there are there does seem to be lots of different radio services around the world apart from amateur radio that people can opt into what's your thoughts on this one dan well so i'm actually a gmrs licensee myself and what i'd say is that while there may be many GMRS licensees who are amateurs. I, th I think that maybe the majority of them really, really don't care about radio so much as what they can do with radio. You know what I'm saying? Like, like for example, you know, they, they like to have radios to talk amongst themselves at family events or outings, but they're, you know, like they really wouldn't care too much about the, uh, the, the new sunspot cycle. So while I'm, you know, I th certainly think it's something we should pursue, I'm not so optimistic that we're going to get a big bang out of it. Well, as you say, they ain't going to be bothered about the sunspot cycles because I believe all the frequencies are up in the UHF band. So, you know, the sunspots aren't going to affect that very, very much, uh, in fairness. So I see where you're coming from it. Now, I believe in the States, and I'll stay with you for a minute, Dan, there's the family radio service, there's the GMRS service, and some of the channels are interlinked, although you need a license for the GMRS. And the family radio service, I don't believe you need a license, but it's lower power. Lower, lower power and a fixed antenna. So, so, so FRS radios, you can't, you can't really do anything except buy a radio and talk on. With GMRS, you can do things like even have repeaters. There are GMS repeaters 
that allow you to you know extend the range of your GMRS system. Yeah, yeah. So it's kind of, I don't know, we probably confuse the hell out of people in the US when we talk about PMR446, only because the four, four, they're in a band around about 446 megahertz, but it used to be eight channels, I believe it's 16 now in the UK, license free, half a watt. So it's probably very similar type service to your family uh, radio service. Uh, would that be correct, Edmund? Well, I'm not an expert on this in the United States. My belief is that the family radio service, which operates on frequencies around 462 and 467 megahertz, is the direct equivalent to PMR446 in Europe, although I believe in in the family radio service there are 22 channels and on some if not all of them you can now do two watts these days as opposed to 500 milliwatts i think but yes family radio service is the direct equivalent of pmr 446 the nearest thing we've got in the uk to gmrs and i think gmrs is it general mobile radio service correct memory Yep. The nearest equivalent is probably the um, UK, well, I know them as UK general frequencies. I think they're called um, something else these days. But the difference is, as Dan has said, um, you can run higher power on GMRS and uh, also you can have repeaters as well. Um, I don't think you can have repeaters legally on the UK general frequencies but I'm, I'm not a license holder for that in the UK, so I don't know. My impression is that many, if not most, GMRS users use radio as a tool in connection with their business or leisure activities rather than using it for radio's sake as an end in itself. But some of them undoubtedly do use it just as a hobby radio thing. So there may be some mileage in the ARRL seeking to tap the interests of uh, radio users on those frequencies. And um, on, in 2019, the one and only time I've ever been to the States, I took a handheld with me, which had uh, many repeaters programmed into it, amateur repeaters, I mean. But I did program in the output frequencies of several GMRS repeaters. And on the limited occasions I had to listen, the amateur radio repeaters were slightly busier, but there was a fair amount of activity that I did hear on GMRS. Obviously, I didn't transmit because that wouldn't have been legal and I don't have a, a GMRS call sign. But the bits that I did hear sounded like people using it as a tool, as I said, rather than radio hobbyists. And that's perhaps borne out by, if you go onto YouTube and type in PMR446DX, you'll get loads of videos, some from England, um, mainly up north where there are lots of hills and high ground and quite a few from the northern French coast. There's a lot of PMR446DXs along there who may or may not be using 500 milliwatts with fixed antennas, but that's, uh, that's their concern, not mine. But if you go onto YouTube and type GMRSDX or FRSDX, then very, very little comes up in comparison. So um, if, incidentally, if anybody in the state listening to this does enjoy, enjoy or, or attempt um, DXing, using 500 milliwatts on FRS, then please let me know because I'd love to see your YouTube videos. Yeah, I've always seen you wandering, pictures of you wandering along the beach with uh, uh, all sorts of uh, radios and some of your communications with France as well across the channel. So, um, yeah. And, yeah, in, in the UK, they say the maximum distance for a uh, PMR446 is about three miles. Well, I've done further than that on a 446, but only because I was right on top of a hilltop 
and it's line of it's UHF line of sight, so you can't say how far it'll go. In fairness, Chris, what's your thoughts? Well, I don't think Edmonds have a lot to say, really. <laughs> the um, I think the point of Frank's article we got this from was really about, and I think Edmund touched on it is. You know, is this is that a potential market for recruiting amateurs? And I think potentially about having read the article, I think it's. Uh, I think it is. I think there's. Um, you know, I think if people are using a radio, whether it's a kind of fixed FM type radio like this is, or you know, channels, or whether it's you know, if people get used to that and think it's interesting and think it's useful, then it might be a, a good ground to uh, to to mine for um, for potential amateurs. So yeah, if they the Barrera or the clubs. See, see a way in to, to promote the hobby with that group. That might be a good. I think the point was that I think there are more people with licenses for journalists than there are for amateur radio. So you know, potentially that is a if they're using it for. Um, and of course, they're paying for the license. Although I suppose technically you also pay now for your amateur license in the states. You know, bring them into the amateur hobby, and people can realise there actually is an awful lot more you can do with you know the things that our license allows us to do. You know, say it might be a. a well, as as um, as Frank's put in his article, you know, it's a compelling market for amateur radio recruitment. So, uh, you know, I'm sure they'll that will be read by many people and in the amateur radio world, and maybe uh, looking to uh, see what they can do to to tempt people across across the the license boundary into our part of the uh, the spectrum, so to speak. Yeah, well, in fairness, and we're never going to get everybody who's on uh, these other services across to amateur radio. And let's be honest, we shouldn't think we will. But if we have a few a uh, percentage across, you know, great. I mean, let's face it, we've got 5% of them across that would still be a reasonable size number into uh, amateur radio. So, you know, I do understand that uh, certainly in the UK, it used to be UK General Licence. I think it's now called UK Simple Light which is mainly used for business use, whereas amateur radio can't be used for business use. And I think it's about £15 a year, uh, from what I remember. And no, you can't use repeaters legally on it, Edmund, because the the frequencies are too close anyway for split, uh, for input and output frequencies, so it wouldn't do you a lot of good. Ed, what's your thoughts on this one? Well, I'd just say it's uh, echoing a lot of what other people have said. These services that are services that don't require taking an exam, if I'm correct in all of these services, it's a matter of you know, filling in the form, paying your money and getting your license. Uh, there will be some people in these groups that are technical and maybe you know, giving them the information that, hey, if you do want to, get more involved in radio not only on uhf but also perhaps on hf or whatever that amateur radio is there that's that's probably you know if you're not going to get 90 percent of them coming over if you get nine percent you're doing very well you might get one or two percent that are interested but it's got to be a um an opportunity for you know the possibility of attracting some more people to join the hobby PMR446, I've just checked, exists here in Germany as well since 1999, and it is considered the equivalent of the FRS in the US, and it is considered to be a hobby band. Uh, Hobby radio is how it's described in, in Germany in the regulations. Going back to my days in Australia, they have what they call UHFCB, and that's uh, Edmund corrected me earlier on uh, before the uh, before the recording. It's the f- called the four seven seven megahertz band. Uh, it actually starts at four seven six. Now I was used to know it as four seven six. But anyway, minor minor detail. But the point of my the statement here is that was another one of these like PMR four four six, like FRS, uh, where you just pay your money, you get your license. Repeaters were allowed. And uh, more importantly, the local radio club that I was a member of, and still I'm a member of, actually put out the amateur radio news broadcast on this CB band, on this UHF CB band, legally and above board and everything was fine, uh, every uh, every week. 
and the club did indeed get three new members in the first year of doing that who came over from CB, got their foundation licence for amateur radio and expanded into the hobby that way. So it does work. It's always a matter of how much time and money do you want to invest to attract a few people over from the other bands, the other hobby uh, into, uh, into amateur radio. But certainly there's a market there if we can sell it in the right way, whether that's in the US, in Australia, or in the UK, in Germany, wherever, that there will be people in there that would be interested in getting into amateur radio. So, you know, what Frank's saying is correct. The question, of course, is uh, how, how do you interest the people? People that are using it for purely business purposes, you're probably not going to interest them at all. Back to you, Martin. Yeah, good good thoughts on that. And in fairness, yes, we will get a few across, I would suggest. But I think we also have to, and this is me going on my soapbox again, if we're going to attract these people in from other radio systems uh, and, and modes and whatever, we have to welcome them. Not be anal and make sure uh, and and put them off talk them down complain that they're not as a higher grade license as you are or whatever i've seen so much of that and in the uk even now the worst people for having a go at cbs are the ex cbs who've just got a foundation license you know why you have to pick the fight, I don't know. I've known three or four people who've done it once they've got their foundation license. You know, if you're interested in radio, uh, if I had a couple of CBs at work and they were sitting chatting to me, I would talk to them. I, I'd be very interested in what they're doing. And in fairness, I'm sure they're interested in what we're doing. But the thing is, we're all interested in radio, and I think that's the important thing. Uh, so. If we do manage to pull people over from other disciplines, then that'll be good, but let's not frighten them away afterwards. That's pretty much me getting off my soapbox. Okay, last news story, and you couldn't help but spot this. This has been all over social media. There's been two things on social media all week, pretty much. One is Bouvet Island and some people bitching about how bad the operators have been and all the bits and pieces and not gentlemanly. And the other news story was of, first off, a so-called Chinese, or it was published as a Chinese uh, spy balloon was shot down. And then later, they then decided that uh, also a hobby balloon uh, with amateur radio on board was allegedly, let's say allegedly, because we can't prove it and we probably never will be able to, shot down by the US Air Force over airspace in Canada. So uh, it's it, it's one of those things. Now, Edmund, do you want to go first on this one? Well, uh, as far as the Bouvet Island thing goes that you mentioned, Martin, if you take into account where they were, what they were doing, the conditions they were operating under on the one hand, and then on the other hand, look at what some amateurs saw fit to post on the cluster, and then you ask yourself which of the two groups covered themselves in glory and which didn't, I think it's not very difficult to come to a conclusion. Let's put it that way. As far as balloons go... The first one, uh, the one that was the size of a double-decker bus, when that was shot down, I heard a, a news report on the radio saying that the military were going to make their detection systems more sensitive, at which point my heart sank because I thought if they do that, they're going to start picking up all these Pico balloons and weather balloons and goodness knows what else that has probably been up there for years and years and years but has probably never been detected before so when they started uncovering further balloons and indeed shooting them down i thought it's only going to be a matter of time before an amateur balloon 
worth a few tens or maybe a couple of hundred dollars at most is going to be shot down by a missile costing over, was it $400,000 or a, a similar number? But I just hope that they they say, don't they, that any publicity is good publicity. I'm not entirely sure that's true, but I just hope that this interests people in the topic of balloons and doesn't go the other way and turn the public in general against the idea of balloons being launched by small amateur groups on the grounds that they're endangering aircraft, endangering national security, all this kind of stuff. Uh, It would be a a terrible shame if we threw the baby out with the bathwater, basically, because um, there there was a report on Radio 4 a couple of mornings back where there was a guy who had released several balloons in previous years directly over London in order to measure nitrogen levels. So that was real-world valuable science being carried out. And I would hate for anything like that to be curtailed simply off the back of what's happened in the last couple of weeks. I think think you're right, Ed, but I think, uh, yeah, okay. The thing is that you're always going to get... people that are going to uh, try things on and we've just been lumped in the word balloon has effectively encompassed anything that's balloon any balloon that's flying at the moment i think hysteria will cut them down soon uh chris what's your thoughts well on the balloon story uh yeah i mean obviously we never quite know do we for certain what's going on because like, i guess that's it's, uh, it's obviously got political and uh and and to a degree you know sensitive i suppose but um the um yeah i mean obviously the first one they shot down well the first one wasn't wasn't it drifting over the country but they didn't want to shoot it down because they worried about where it might land and then it went over the water and then they sent up some very expensive fighter jets to, to fire some very expensive missiles at it and shot it down and then well, you know obviously there's been a few others that have been noticed and uh have, and they've had this come to the same fate now whether they've just overreacted or you know who knows? Hopefully, this isn't going to affect. You know, we know that people, both in and out of our hobby, do launch balloons for a variety of reasons, and uh, often they're trapped using amateur radio. So, uh, so we can, you know, it's often they'll, you know, send something up, take some pictures up in the, you know, really high up, you know, so you can see the curvature of the Earth and that sort of thing. And then, it, and then it will, the balloon will pop and it will come down back to Earth, and you've got to try and track it and find it. And they'll often use radio technology in our world to to do that. And uh, it'd be a real shame if, there is a, as a result of that, it affects our hobby. Hopefully, um, hopefully that won't be the case, but uh, we shall have to see. But no, I mean, yeah, not not a huge amount to add on my phone this one. Yeah, yeah. Well, let's see what happens. Dan, now, I know the US Air Force shot it down. I'm not getting you to say anything you shouldn't. And uh, I feel sorry for you because it's part of your taxpayer money that paid for the missile <laughs> that you've got to re- cut, replenish in the coffers somewhere. but. What's your thoughts? Well, first off, uh, the one that was shot down in Canada was actually shot down in in cooperation with the Canadians. So the U.S. and Canada have set up a thing called NORAD, North American Defense something or other. And uh, its whole purpose is to uh, uh, monitor the airspace uh, up up there in the, the Great White North. And so so that it's, it's not a an issue that a U.S. jet shot down this thing over Canadian airspace. But I have, a several, I have you know, se- several thoughts about that. First off, you know, and Chris brought this up just now, is the extreme cost of this thing. You know, I mean, one, like he says, one of those missiles costs more than $400,000. And, and to waste them on shooting these balloons is, I, I, I'm, I'm almost speechless about it. I mean, it, you would think that, they would have another way to bring those balloons down that don't, doesn't cost four hundred thousand dollars, or even if it does cost a lot of money, wouldn't be so damaging to the payload. I mean, we're interested in seeing what the payload is, obviously. Well, why not bring it down so that the payload isn't damaged as as much as it was, and then having to recover it over water? All, that's how it's got to be 
you know, an expensive exercise as well. Two, uh, so there, in addition to the, to the Chinese weather, quote, quote unquote weather balloon, there were actually three other objects. Well, I'll say objects because they're not sure what they were uh, shot down over the U.S. and Canada. One was actually here in Michigan, which was uh, just off the coast of Michigan in Lake Huron, one of the uh, five great lakes. And it, it must have been a really a small balloon because uh, they, at least they say that they couldn't find the the payload, and it, you know it must have been awful small to, uh, you know, not have been recoverable or you know so such that they couldn't find it. And and you know in, in a way, right? There's a there's a a method for them, or a method to their madness. They 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 don't want to be found out. And and that one actually took two missiles. So actually, it cost close to a million dollars to shoot that one because the first one missed. So it must that's another way to think that it's small. But but they don't they don't want to be ashamed <laughs> if they had actually recovered the payload. They wouldn't want to say it because if it was just a hobbyist balloon, you know, they would have to admit they spent eight hundred thousand dollars to shoot down a hobbyist balloon. And then then my third point here is <laughs> is even sort of a little bit more uh, more out there. So you know, I'm on Twitter. I'm I follow a lot of people on Twitter. Well, uh, th this has been sort of a, uh, a festival for the UFO folks. You know, they they're all claiming that the, you know, especially now that they're saying, well, we couldn't find this uh, this payload, and and you know, the they're claiming uh, uh, you know up and down that the Chinese thing that they shot down was just a weather balloon. You know, they, all these UFO folks are saying, "Oh no, this is these are UFOs. This is a you know alien life here." And uh, so, I I don't know about that, but I but I got a kick out of reading all that stuff. So I don't know. I'll 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 make one final quote here. You know, we used to have a show here called the X Files, right? And the X Files was supposedly a couple of FBI agents uh, uh, investigating UFOs and paranormal uh, phenomena. And their their tagline was always "the truth is out there." So that's what I'll end with: is the truth is out there. Yeah, I agree. The truth is out there, Dan. But I don't think you and I are ever going to be told the truth. You know, if they've cocked up, they will uh, keep that one quiet for a long time, and it probably won't be really become unsecret for about fifty or sixty years. In which case, nobody's going to give two hoots about it. But there you go. <laughs> Ed, last words on this one? Yeah, um, I'll jump in on the 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 other comment about the de expedition to Bouvier as well. Not specifically Bouvier, but I, I'm actually rather surprised that people are surprised. De expeditions attract bad operators operating on top of them, etc., on the bands, and have done for many many years. And also the vile comments and insults and all the rest flying around on the internet. It's normal with de expeditions. I went on a small de expedition, as you probably know, in 2011, and even we got that kind of um, abuse and unnecessary uh, aggro for things for something we paid for ourselves. Uh, there seems to be a, an element within the hobby, unfortunately. Um, it's probably an element in this in society in general that just like being troublemakers and they think they can do it secretly on the internet or over the air or whatever. But this has happened to every single de expedition that's been around for the last fifteen twenty years, and I am completely not surprised that it happened to Bouvet as well. Good on those guys for managing what they did in bad conditions. Uh, they actually managed to land. The last two didn't. So good on them. Anyway, let's get on to the subject that's actually in, in the show notes. The shooting down of, possible shooting down of a amateur uh, balloon. Uh, first of all, I, I have memories of a coverage we did maybe 18 months ago, and I'm not sure if it was here or our newsline, about a company that were going to use balloons to provide uh, internet coverage on the ground where you otherwise couldn't get it. And these would be maneuverable, enormous balloons 
uh, with the link from them, I think, going up to satellites, etc., and then internet provided that way. I'm just wondering if that's what this first so-called Chinese spy balloon was, that it was actually these guys experimenting with uh, a solution now. Timing would be about right. Uh, whether they were doing it for a um, division of the military that didn't tell another division of the military that it was up there, or whether it was for, it's planned for commercial usage and sale, we'll, we'll never know. As always, you know, these things will just get covered up. Uh, and I was amazed that they used a missile to shoot down the fourth one, this party balloon. I would have thought that he used a cannon. Obviously, maybe you don't fit cannons to, to fight an aircraft anymore. Maybe it's only to helicopters, but using a $400,000 missile to, to shoot down a party balloon, whether it should have been there or not, and who put it there or not, that's just ludicrous, quite honestly. Um, and yeah, this will all get hushed up, as you said, Martin. We won't hear anything for 20 years or more, by which time people won't care. But let's hope it doesn't affect the rest of the world, because I'm hoping they might be doing a balloon launch from Friedrichshafen again this year. They haven't the last few years because of you know, things being cancelled because of COVID, but it used to be a regular event that one or even two small balloons were launched and then tracked and hunted, uh, leaving from Friedrichshafen from Ham Radio, uh, from the Ham Radio Expo. And um, fingers crossed they're going to do it again this year. They haven't announced anything yet, but it's certainly, for me, a, uh, a very interesting thing to watch what they can do with the small electronics and everything else. Uh, that's about it from me, Martin. Back to you. Yeah, yeah. Well, as I say, the whole thing about this is I don't think we'll ever be told the truth on this this one. There are a lot of jokers on the internet. I've seen all sorts of modified pictures, various people talking about the balloons, and it's made a lot of the news feeds. But in fairness, I don't think we'll ever know 100%. Anyway, that's uh, an interesting one. And uh, as I say, some of it is joking, some of it is serious. We'll have to wait and see. So there we go. Okay, let's find out what the guys have been up to since the last time I uh, spoke to them. Uh, let's start with you, Dan. What have you been up to since we last spoke? What have I been up to? Well, two two things. So I've started work on my general class study guide, and um, that's going okay. Also, I'm uh, operating as W1AW-8 uh, this week. Now, it's part of this Volunteers on the Air uh, project. And that's fun, uh, you know. Not a not a ton of activity, but uh, but it's fun always to operate a special event, and especially using the W one A W call sign. So that's uh, that's what I've been up to. Yeah, sounds good, Dan. And the W one A W special event, uh, it's got to be a, a good one, as you say. So uh, yeah, I um. I know you've also been doing a lot with the uh, ARDC, haven't you? I've seen you post quite a bit recently on that. Well, you know, <laughs> that's my job, right? So, uh, yeah, and, and, you know, the the new services have uh, uh, been nice to pick those up. And uh, the one you probably saw, they actually wanted to quote me for some reason. But, uh, yeah, that's that's fine with me, too. But yeah, that's my job. So uh, I'm glad uh, other people are noticing these uh, these ARDC news stories. Yeah, yeah, they're always worth reading. I'll give you that, Dan. So uh, that's a good one. Uh, Edmund, what have you been up to? Well, I really enjoyed visiting the Canvey Island uh, rally with uh, your good self, Martin, earlier in February. Looking forward to Hamzilla in March. But in terms of actually going on the air and transmitting, I don't think I have since the last time we spoke. I've been doing a lot of listening to various frequencies, and I think with all this talk of balloons, I might be paying more attention to the APRS and Whisper websites to see if I can track a few balloons on there. If you listen, 
just above 404 megahertz in the UK. You can hear data from balloons launched by the Met Office. And uh, if you've got the correct software on your computer, you can decode the data they send down. And uh, if you jump in your car and drive to where it's landed, you can even retrieve the equipment if you're uh, lucky enough. And then if you're really clever, you can reprogram it to act as a CW beacon on the 70 centimeter band at 50 milliwatts. But uh, that's uh, way above my pay grade, unfortunately. But there are videos on the on uh, YouTube, of course. So uh, apart from that, um, no, life has just been so busy. And I, I have been watching and listening to the news quite a lot because there's so much going on in the world at the moment. Um, not least stories about Chinese spy balloons <laughs> over America. So haven't had much, uh, many opportunities to to go on the air, Martin. But uh, hopefully, well, I, actually, I say hopefully. We, we've just started Lent, haven't we? So maybe I should uh, give up watching so many videos on YouTube and uh, not just give that up, but also take up something in its place and that should really be turning the radio on so maybe i'll be actually transmitting on some of the higher hf bands now that we've got good propagation martin how about that well that sounds good to me and it sounds like you've been having fun anyway and you didn't you forgot to mention we had the boss with us didn't we when we were at canby island oh yes yes there's there's a good photograph of, of her that I may or may not put on the ICQ po- podcast uh, Facebook group. Well, I haven't seen that one, so uh, yeah, you go. But yeah, Mrs. B joined us for the um, Canby Island Rally, and she will be with us at uh, Hamzilla. Also, Colin will be there, and I'm sure you're coming, aren't you, Chris? Yeah, I'm planning to be Hamzilla, absolutely, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So what have you been up to then, Chris? What have I been up to? Not a massive amount. Uh, I've been off, off work for uh, a couple of weeks to take some, using some holiday up. I'm back at work this week. but So I was in Tenerife for, for the first of those two weeks. So I was operating, didn't take anything apart from my handheld and my uh, digital hotspot. So I was operating on the talk group as EA8 slash M0TCH. I think I worked you, Martin, a couple of times. Um, but uh, apart from that, I didn't take anything else with me in terms of radio gear. And then the second uh, week I came back, I decided to go to Wales for a few days and decided to go up Mount Snowdon. And uh, so I activated Snowdon again. I did it last year as well uh, for SOTA. So I, this time I got an extra three points because it was winter. So uh, that was quite nice. And uh, made five contacts, and uh, three of which were summit to summit. So that was quite nice as well. So. Uh, Pretty much that. I mean, I've made a couple of contacts on HF, but nothing to particularly write home about. So, yeah, I mean, other things that are not that exciting are being doing quite a bit of club admin, sending out emails, trying to get people to do talks and that sort of thing for us later in the year, etc. But uh, no, that's about it for me, Martin. Yeah, well, it's only, you know, it's only a couple of weeks since you were last on, but yeah, it's, uh, it's good fun. And uh, I know you enjoyed your trip to Snowden, so that was a good one, as well as your trip to Tenerife. Ed, what have you been up to since we last spoke? Well, uh, coming back to what we were talking about, the fact that the solar cycle is uh, is taking off. This morning I was up on a summit about 40 minutes away from here and on 20 metres, 20 watts and a wire antenna, first contact, Australia. So I think conditions are quite good. Um, I was actually testing out a new antenna, uh, or not a new antenna, but an antenna I don't often use. And it seems to be performing rather well. Uh, So that's all good news. So, yeah, always a bit of SOTA, a bit of antenna work here, as you know. And the other thing I've got coming up is uh, I don't think we have that many German listeners, but uh, don't forget, please, next month we've got an amateur radio convention in Munich. And that's March 11th and 12th. And I'll be there on the... um, uh, the mountain radio table, so the SOTA, HEMA, GMA, uh, all of the award schemes, uh, with lots of other people to talk about uh, ac- uh, operating portable. I'm already uh, about a quarter of the way through uh, surveying a new HEMA region, 
because I uh, finished the whole of Germany. I'm now starting on Austria, uh, partly because I'm going there in June for a, a few days on holiday. So uh, I'm starting around the Salzburg uh, area of Austria, uh, defining the uh, all the HEMA summits around there. And I'm also starting to prepare, of course, I mentioned earlier, for uh, Ham Radio in Friedrichshafen, the biggest amateur radio convention in Europe and probably the best in the world from point of view of facilities. So we're looking forward to that and I'm saying hoping they might get a balloon up as well. And yeah, more antenna stuff. And uh, uh, as I'll be going away on holiday later on in the year um, in a plane, I'm also trying to sort out some kind of small antenna to go with my little uh, G106 uh, handy portable. It's about the size of an FT817, uh, probably a bit smaller. Um, rather than taking the G90, as I uh, usually use for portable operation, if I'm flying somewhere, I'd like to take the smaller radio and uh, a smaller antenna, of course, as well, to go with it. So... That's going to be a bit of a puzzle over the next few months, finding what's best for that. But, uh, yeah, mainly portable operations and radio and antenna work. So uh, you can tell the snow's cleared here. Despite that, there's some more forecast for the weekend. Back to you, Martin. Yeah, sounds like you've been having fun, though. And say so hopefully you won't get too much snow. Right, from my point of view, what have I been up to? Well, number one, I need to start with an apology. An apology to the digital group users. Unfortunately, last weekend, the D-Star transcoder that also uh, has effects or does some work with the M17 and P25 uh, actually lives at my house for reasons of you can't uh, plug a dongle into a data center machine without paying a hell of a lot of money for it. So. Uh, and it was down for two and a half days because yours truly changed his internet provider. Now I'm not taking you. Th- I'm not going to talk too much about it now because I'm going to run that as a fe- most of the feature because there are one or two mega gotchas which can really screw up your amateur radio stuff. So I'll cover that mainly in the feature. I had my first contact a couple of weeks ago on 23 SEMS. And uh, yes, it was a uh, FM contact. Uh, I'll probably mention that as well at the end of the end of the feature. But um, this was uh, only, well, with Martin Rothwell. He lives about five miles from me. I have, I now have a uh, 23 SEMS collinear. And I don't have the correct cable on it and connectors, but so I got a bit of loss on it, but it's only a short length of cable. And an antenna up is better than no antenna up. I managed to work Martin Rothwell. He's over a hill from me. So there's there's a hill behind me and between him and I. And I thought that the higher in frequency you went, the more line of sight it was. But I managed to have quite a good uh, clear conversation with Martin running four watts uh, into this uh, collinear. Five watts off my radio and it makes just under four watts at the antenna. So uh, still losses on a three meter length of cable. So um, yeah, got to be a bit careful on that. But it worked. Got given an RF probe, an old Heathkit RF probe. Took it apart. Fixed a couple of uh, niceties on it, put a better earth on it, and uh, had it running the other day. That was an interesting little toy to play with. Uh, Quite interesting to play with it. Edmund, you will be getting your whisper light back when I see you. Uh, Edmund gave me his whisper light. An interesting thing on the whisper light. Uh, And I don't know if it's just Edmund's one or all of them, but... The if you've got a whisper light, it might be worth opening it up and putting some solder on the um, the mounting points for the for the USB socket because Edmunds hadn't taken solder and there was effectively a couple of uh, pads under the socket that had held it on the board and the five little wires which are like uh, hair look like hairs 
um, holding the thing on the board. Over time, pushing the connector in and pulling it out, it had uh, disconnected it from the board. And if the um, if the metal case where it surfed had been soldered down to the chassis, it would have given it far more support. So if you've got a whisper light, I'm not knocking soda beans, but if you've got a whisper light, might be worth checking that you've got your earth soldered down. Edmund, yours is coming back to you very, very soon. Almost last one. Uh, if any amateurs are going to the NAB, the uh, NAB National Broadcasters Association Broadcasters is happening in Las Vegas. It's happening in Las Vegas. Um, if any of you are going, can you give me a quick shout and just let me know how uh, you're going and what, what's happening and just if you're a bit of it about it, because I'm I'm interested. Uh, I'm not going myself, but I'm interested. And last but not least, mentioned on the last podcast, but I'm also going to start um, putting stuff up on the internet. We're about to do another 12-hour session of our digital talk group and getting all the modes together and having a good chat on Saturday the 4th of March. That's going to be between... 7 UTC and 1900 UTC. So 12 hours, we should be able to find enough time to find all of us to get together at some point in time in that 12 hours. So that's what I've been up to, guys. You know, fairly busy, but yeah, there's always room for more improvement, isn't there? So there you go. Right, all that's left for me to do now is thank the guys for joining me tonight. I'd like to thank Mr. Jan Rovacek, KB6NU. Well, you're very welcome, Martin. Thanks, Dan. Mr. Edmund Spicer, M0MMG. Thanks for having me on, Martin. That's a good one, Edmund. Mr. Ed Dredd, DD5LP. Thanks a lot, and uh, see you all in a month's time. Is it? Is it? Is it uh, for example? That can't be a for example. No, no, no. I'll talk to you all again in a oh, month's right. time. You, you, <laughs> you put me in full scale <laughs> panic there, Ed. <laughs> can't be for example next month. I, and last but not least, I'd like to thank Mr. Chris Howard, who joined us at short notice um, because uh, at one point in time, Edwin wasn't sure if he could make it tonight. And uh, Karen, as I say, is uh, uh, unable to attend for, for a, a family reason. So and we'll be with us again. So thanks, Chris. Thank you, Martin. Just had this vision of you there checking your passport, panicking that you, were, <laughs> you weren't going to make it in time. But so now I've got a bit of time before Fruit Island. And, uh, I'm planning to be there as well, so that should be a uh, should be a lot of fun. Yep, yep. And the boss, you know, the boss is going to freak Sarvan, don't you? Oh, she keeps in check. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yes, yes. Yes. I wonder how many people she's going to convince she's the boss this time. <laughs> anyway, that's another story. Right, who's left for me to do now, guys, is to uh, wish you all seventy threes and continue with the po- rest of the podcast. Seventy three, guys. Seventy three. Seventy three. Seventy three. Keep your amateur ham radio podcast advert free by donating less than a length of coax. Visit www.icqpodcast.com forward slash donate now. For all the news, links and information, visit www.icqpodcast.com. And now it's time to have a look at the news in brief for me, Colin M6BOY. We start off with news here of a potential safety issue affecting uh, fluke multimeters uh, that might be of interest to some of you. It affects the 83V, 87V and 88V model of the digital fluke meters. And as a precautionary measure, Fluke has alerted customers to this uh, safety issue and requested users to perform a simple check to verify the unit is not impacted by the safety issue. Um, so basically, um, you need to observe at Pacific orientation the test lead plug with the input terminal when you use the split core TL75 test leads that shipped in certain regions of project uh, product. And uh, as I say, there is a potential uh, that I say this can be damaged. Um, so I say do certainly check that out from there and see if that uh, is one that uh, you have a problem with. Now, as always with these things, there is an opportunity for you to go online and check these things. So we'll put the link on icqpodcast.com for you to check to see if your uh, leads could be a problem with your fluke tester. And again, if you can, contact the manufacturer and I'm sure they'll look after you and uh, sort of go from there. So a big safety announcement there for you if you're an owner of a fluke digital meter. 
Our next news story is congratulations to John Gendron, uh, November Juliet for Zulu, who's been named the recipient of the uh, most recent award, the 2022 Roanoke Division AWL Special Service Award. It's the highest and most prestigious recognition of an AWRL member operator within the division's four states and has shown consistent C and extensive leadership qualities. Now, John was first licensed technician in 2016 and quickly advanced through the grades uh, to become an extra class licensee. At the same time, he's helped to uh, revitalize amateur radio uh, emergency services, Aries, in his area, uh, as well as the York County Amateur Radio Society in South Carolina. Uh, so I say he really sounds like he's really got stuck into the hobby and uh, really taken part of it for now. He's been featured uh, in uh, QST uh, for club station uh, comment. Uh, he also runs a YouTube channel from the Ham Shack and is an avid DX chaser and can be often found activating parks on the air as well. So congratulations to you, John, for your uh, wonderful award and your uh, great work for the amateur radio hobby. Talking about promoting the hobby, we head to the UK now where the ARSGB has announced Liam Robbins, Golf 5 Lima Delta Romeo, as its new appointed youth champion. He gained his foundation license in 2021 and progressed to his full license in late 2022. His volunteering experience includes being a scout leader for eight years and a motorsport marshal for three years as well. He plans to encourage the use of amateur radio to local scout groups and spread this to a wider area, using the benefits gained locally as an example of best practice. So he's also keen to revive radio societies at universities and colleges near his home in Nottinghamshire in the Midlands of the UK and hopes this will encourage others to follow suit. So if you wish to uh, reach uh, Liam, you can contact him at youth.champion at rsgb.org.uk. Right now we head over to our features episode, double feature for you this episode, a 23 SEMS antenna review and trouble with ISP changeovers. As always, hope you enjoy. And now what you've all been waiting for, this episode's feature from the ICQ podcast. Well, hi guys, for this feature, or I should say features, I'm going to do two quick features. One is radio related, specifically, and the other one is very closely radio related, and some of you uh, may find the help from that. Now, the first one, I managed to get an evaluation. Uh, it was sent to me by uh, Mike at Seacom Antennas in the UK. He sent me his 23 SEMS collinear antenna to have a look at and the reason he did that was because mike and i were chatting about uh, various things at the national ham fest in the uk mike's come up with a nice 23 sims collinear antenna so what makes it so nice well <laughs> i saw us amateurs always like price but i'll talk to you about that in a minute the antenna arrived it was nicely packed uh, so it wouldn't get damaged through the post. Ideally, it looks like a diamond antenna or better, and I'm sure it is. The antenna itself, 23 sems collinear. It's not a short antenna. It's about just over a metre, a metre and a bit long. It covers uh, between 1 to, to 40 and 1300 uh, megahertz. So it covers the whole of the 23 SAMS band, effectively. It has a power handling rating of 200 watts. I can't prove that because I, <laughs> my rig will only do 10. But that doesn't matter. Mike's built it for quality. Uh, it's VSWR is below 1.5 across the whole band. So, uh, and as we would expect, wouldn't think of anything less, it has an N-type connector fitted to it. So, with that in mind, and my trusty uh, ICOM 9700, which I've never had a contact on 23 cents before Mike's uh, antenna arrived, I set about installing it. 
Now, this antenna has a 10 dBi gain, so, uh, you know, that's quite impressive as well. So what did I do? Well, we went outside and uh, we started uh, looking at where I could put the antenna. Now, verticals, everybody's going to say to me, ah, oh, you don't want a vertical because, you know, everybody's on, on a beam and one thing or another. Well, there's lots of us that can't put beams up. However, you know, the vertical could help. Martin Rothwell, M0SGL, uh, another presenter here, tells me that he does actually work people on his antenna, which is a vertical, and uh, he's worked people on the sideband. Now, I know that there is a polarisation problem, but let just bear with me on this. You know, if you can't put an antenna up th th because you haven't got space for it to rotate something, then, you know, why not try this sort of thing? Okay, so that our first problem we're going to end up with nicely because the antenna itself is going to cost you just shy of £50, pounds, five zero pounds. Everything else on the market for a vertical for... 23 sems is getting close to 200 pounds so this antenna is a quarter of the price you know i think mike sells them far too cheaply they are nicely made as i say they use marine grade fiberglass for the tubing and aluminium fittings to hold the antenna at the bottom so well made as i say and i was most impressed with this Okay, let's now talk about uh, my my installation. Well, any antenna at 23 sems is going to require expensive cable. You have to accept that. And you can't just go using the standard coax. Or if you do, like I did, you've got to only have a short run. So... I knew that uh, I was going to put this collinear in less than three metres from my radio. So I then decided that at three metres, I worked out the coax loss and on RG213, which is not the right cable to use, if I transmitted five watts from my rig, by the time it had gone through three metres of cable, I was going to lose a watt, and they get about four watts at the antenna. Once again, as I said to you, some fitting, uh, some antennas are better than no antenna, or one antenna is better than no antenna. So uh, there you go. Ideally, you need LMR four hundred or Heliax with the relevant connectors, and uh, as you well know, LM four hundred. And Heliax is expensive, and so are the connectors for it. That's not Mike's fault. Well, that is just the way it is. And talking to my friend Phil in Australia, the UK is too expensive. It'll be half price. It's pounds to dollars for the Australians, so they're getting it half price to us, uh, which just proves the UK is expensive. I installed it. Great. No problems at all. My first contact, okay, not a million miles away, Mr. Martin Rothwell, who lives about five miles from me, on a vertical. I live the other side of the hill from him. I live down in the valley, effectively. There's a big hill the other side of me. The signal I thought was going to be predominantly line of sight, I was running 5 watts at the rig, so about 4, just under 4 at the antenna, with the cable I was running, with losses in the cable, and I had an armchair copy with Martin at just over 5 miles away. Now, I'm going to do more and more testing, but I'm really, really impressed with this antenna. It uh, really does well, and I think, you know, for the price, you can't beat it. Seacom antennas have done a terrific job on this. Seacom is spelled C E E C O M. And to find their website, it's www.seacom, which is S E E C O M hyphen antennas.com. Now, I'm going to give you the main website because Mike 
does other antennas, and this is not the first antenna of his I've got. I actually have a 4 metre dipole, a 2 metre dipole, and a 77 dipole, believe it or not. And all three of those were absolutely brilliantly made and good quality antennas. So, in fairness, if you're thinking of a 23 Sam's antenna, I'm extremely happy with the one I've got. So, uh, yeah, it's up to you guys. But if you want to pay nearly £200 for a diamond antenna, or don't let me put you off, but even if you uh, buy a tri-band antenna, you've still got to put the Heliax or the LMR400 if you want to use the 23 Sems part of that antenna. So, uh, yeah, I'm more than happy with mine. Um, hopefully, lots of people around the London area will hear me on 23 Sems going forward. I hope this part was interesting. Next part, I'm going to tell you about a real tale of woe. Guys, second part of this uh, feature is about uh, problems I have with my new ISP, Internet Service Provider. Now, you might want to just switch off and go, I don't care, I don't know anything about this, I don't want to know. Those of you who listen, some of you might know a lot more about it than me. Most of the people I've spoken to and told about this weren't aware of this problem, so it might just be worth listening. I changed my ISP. Basically, they were getting far too expensive, and I had a new ISP offer me a deal which was far better than what I was getting on the old ISP for 40% of the cost. So I was saving 60% of the money I spend every month. Well, in, in a basically in a, in a couple of years, I could probably buy a, new, new, a, a nice new radio, a big one, not just a handy talkie. So it was a significant saving. Now, what then I found, I went ahead, we, we started, I put the network in, uh, connect up my router, and uh, they said to me, no problems, just go from our man in the middle box straight to the, the router. We'll give you a signal. You're okay. Just carry on as normal. Well, that would have been the, the thing. I then quite happily, and I've apologized for this on the uh, what I've been up to, but I'll also apologize here. I ended up taking the digital talk group down uh, for D-Star. P25 and, and M17 for about two and a half days. Reason for this was that theoretically, the way the system was set up, all I had to do was change one IP address up on the server at, in Docklands, our uh, multi reflector up in the Docklands, change one IP address there, and it all should have worked. So I went about finding these IP addresses, and most of you will know that if you type what's my IP in a browser, it tells you what your internet IP address is out in the real world. Did this, and that was the address I was needing to tell the server in Docklands where to find my house, because the uh, D-Star transcoder lives at my house. Okay, so that was my first problem. So it wouldn't find it. And uh, the transcoder, I put the IP address in, the transcoder restarted, restarted the server up in Docklands, and they didn't communicate. I then had a look at my router to find that I'd got a completely different IP address that my router thought was the outside world, was a completely different IP address to the one when I typed, what's my IP? Okay, I'm quite happy with that. I'll put that address in and then still found that it didn't work. After lots of head scratching and struggling and trying all sorts of bits and pieces, my good friend Andy, and I uh, i can't thank him enough for this, came to my rescue and said, Martin, you have carrier-grade natting. Your ISP is operating carrier-grade natting, which is an absolute nightmare for anybody that wants to do anything clever. If you just want to surf the internet, watch Netflix, do Facebook, a bit of email, 
and you'll be okay with carrier grade natting. But if you want to do other things, like I was, and have um, a transcoder at my house communicating with the Docklands, you're somewhat screwed because you, they, it can't find its way back to your, your, your network. So after a lot of uh, work on this, Andy was able to set me up an IP tunnel from my internal network here through to where my uh, data centre is in London Docklands and my transcoder and the uh, multi-reflector up in the Docklands now communicate quite happy via a secure um, tunnel, a VPN tunnel there. So that was how we got around that. But that wouldn't have been me that sorted that out uh, as quick as Andy did. Andy sorted that out very quickly. Can't thank him enough. Uh, now, carrier grade datting. The reason they do that is because they've got more customers and they've got IP addresses. And it's a bit like cell towers. You know, you, you sign a cell tower as you're driving around. And if uh, they don't put millions of uh, connections into each cell tower, because they re reckon that there aren't going to be many people in it at any one time. So effectively, as you move on from one to the other, it frees up and you take up another slot somewhere else. This is kind of what they do. You're not going to be connected to the internet all the time, so they give you a short buzz connection and then take it away, I think, as far as I can understand this. So, they call this service carrier-grade natting. So, effectively, your network address translation nat is where you, your PCs on your own internal LAN uh, connect through your router to the real world. And that's what I had before. And I had an IP address on my real world that I could always talk back to my house on. Now, my original IS didn't give me a static IP address. So I signed up for a service called Dynamic DNS, which effectively, every time the ISP would change my IP address, Dynamic DNS would say, OK, and re-register me in the DNS so I could be found easy. In reality, the ISP never changed my IP address, but that was a belt and braces for us. On carrier-grade natting, dynamic DNS doesn't work. It finds a network address within the, the, uh, the system where you can't get back to it. So uh, that's a no-no. And you cannot get back. Now, other things you may find is that your network at some point in time might actually get blocked or your ISP might actually get blocked for abuse. And if that happens, pretty much everybody uh, gets stuck with that. You can't do any end-to-end -end routing on, on carrier grade netting, which is another real pain. And certain internet protocols don't work through that. Things like uh, VoIP services don't work. And you may also run into some gaming problems. Now, for me, okay, I used to run a web server at home, mainly for my use when I was out and about. If I wanted certain files that were on my web server, I could look them up. I also had, in my shack, Hamshack Hotline, which is a VoIP service. Neither of those work anymore, since uh, I've got an ISP that's got uh, carrier-grade natting. The transcoder, as I already mentioned, for the digital group, fortunately Andy fixed that for me, but that didn't work for two and a half days. And the other thing that I'm, it won't work is some of these remote desktop apps where you can connect to a desktop and fix the problem, which for me was quite useful to fix Mrs. B's problems when she had them. But equally... I might want to dial into my network and take control of one of my computers remotely. Can't do that anymore because both Microsoft and Linux have uh, their remote desktop operation where you can connect to them. You can't do that over the internet. So how do you know if you're going to uh, have this problem? Well, pretty much any 
cellular type network that anybody tries to sell you is going to have carrier grade natting. You know, that's just the way they work. That's how the cellular network works. So they will have carrier grade natting if you're going to have a cellular connection to the internet. If you find that your outside world on your router is connected to 100.64, somewhere between 64 and 90, then your carrier grade network natting. And, you know, you'll have these problems. Now, in fairness, as I said earlier, if you only want to surf the internet to do all the simple things that every, most people do, you'll be perfectly okay with that. It's only when us amateurs start doing all sorts of fancy things and start having problems. And I'm also, although I haven't checked it, I'm also suggesting that you probably can't do remote control on rigs if you're on a carrier grade natting system. So just be aware, if you're thinking of changing ISPs for cost reasons, then why not ask that ISP, are they carrier grade natting? Yeah, but find out first and don't get caught like I did. I'm going to try and work my way around a lot of these things because uh, I've burnt my bridges with the original ISP. Them and I parted company, not very happy. So, uh, so just a thought and uh, it may be worth you looking into. But once again, check if you're moving ISP that you don't get caught with a carrier grade natting problem. And uh, yeah, hopefully... This might be of interest. I'm sorry if I've laboured it a bit long, but I don't want other people to have the aggravation I've just gone through. Well, welcome back, everybody, and I really hope you enjoyed our uh, couple of features there this episode on the 23 Sam's Antenna Review and uh, just giving you a heads up on potentially some ISP troubles uh, that uh, you may come into when changing your ISP. And, Dad, I know uh, you know what seemed like a very simple task of uh, just changing over your internet provider and saving a couple of quid uh, became an interesting challenge for you, didn't it? Certainly did, Colin, and it wasn't just a couple of quid. It was, uh, you know, a massive saving by changing the provider, but also a massive headache, uh, which, you know, th there are ways around solving it. And um, once again, I was very grateful for Andy sorting out uh, the digital talk group for me and getting that, at least that part working. The rest can be done uh, when I'm less pressured. But... Yeah, it was uh, it was an interesting one, Colin, and um, hopefully, just enlightening people that they don't walk into the same thick problems I had. That was all. Yeah, no, exactly, and, and certainly a good heads up, as you say. And the things we bump into along the way when we uh, when we think say it's uh, it's going to work out is always interesting to know. Now, uh, we've got a busy uh, few weeks coming up, and the first thing uh, coming up in next weekend is our digital talk group, uh, a weekend day where we uh, open up our uh, talk group uh, for uh, a non-standard use, should we say. You know, everybody, of course, can be on it every single day and, and talk it away to presenters and then, then other fellow listeners of the ICQ podcast. But uh, we're going to uh, have a, an open day where we're all going to hope to be online for the day to uh, you know show people how uh, great the talk group is. Yeah, we certainly are, Colin, and unfortunately, since I've been back to work, uh, what tends to happen is I'm not on quite as much as I would have been when I was at home all the time, but uh, I'm intending to be on from 7 uh, UTC to 1900 UTC, uh, which is 12 hours. Hopefully, everybody can join us, and I've also put this uh, very well publicised now on Facebook, and that's uh, quite an interesting one. Um, Emily, the lovely lady from Hamzilla, has already sort of liked my by post up on, uh, up on the YouTube. And the week after that, on the 12th, we're at Hamzilla. And uh, we're at Hamzilla. Colin's joining us. Uh, so there'll be quite a few of the team at Hamzilla uh, you can talk to us. You can probably get a live, well, you will be able to get a live demonstration of the talk group there and then. And if that ain't enough for you, I'm doing a talk uh, on the uh, talk group and how it all works uh, up on them with them 
And yeah, Emily's already said she's uh, quite in, quite looking forward to uh, seeing us there. So that'll be good, Colin. Yeah, and uh, just to echo there what uh, Dad was saying is that uh, I'll be flying in for Hamzilla in a couple of weekends' time into the UK. So I've uh, taken an opportunity to uh, cross off a few things, and one of them is to uh, get to my first ham fest of uh, 2023, which I'm looking forward to. So uh, please, if you're uh, in the uh, southeast of uh, England, uh, that weekend's uh, pop down. I believe it's a, a great show, uh, one worthwhile going to, and uh, as I say, come along and uh, meet up with uh, your orange uh, shirt-wearing ICQ podcast presenters and uh, as a touch base just let us know about uh, your joys of the hobby and uh, what you think about what's going on etc we'd love to uh, hear from you and say hello and uh, you know so obviously yeah, you know catch up with everybody at the hamzilla event uh, that pl- is taking place on the uh, 12th of march if i'm correct uh, yeah 12th of march they're down in kent in the uk so please feel free to come along and check us out from there Right, well, I think that just about wraps up uh, that show for you, this uh, show episode number 397. Uh, as always, we'd like to thank our monthly and description donors that uh, keep your show advert-free for yourself. As always, you can uh, take part in uh, that uh, in very important fundraising uh, by showing the value you get from the show by going to icqpodcast.com forward slash donate. As I say, uh, whatever value you find our show, send our way, and it's always greatly appreciated uh, for you to help us out. We'd like to thank uh, Dan, Kilo Bravo 6, November Uniform, Edmund, Mike Zero, Mike November Golf, Ed, DD5, Lima Papa, and Chris, Mike Zero, Tango, Charlie Hotel for taking part in the news round table with us. Uh, and say, I'm making this episode uh, very possible. Right, well, as always, I think that just about sums up our show uh, this episode, Dad. And uh, I'm going to uh, bid you a uh, fantastic uh, weekend, as always, and hope you continue to enjoy uh, this wonderful hobby of ours. Uh, but before that, uh, there's a very important job to do of a cup of tea and a, and a nice biscuit for Mum and uh, to look after, uh, say, before you go off and uh, do your uh, weekend chores. Yeah, no problems at all, Colin. Uh, yeah, I'll go and make me and Mum a cup of tea. We'll find a, a trolley Becky. And, yeah, your mum and I are going to spend a bit of time before I've got some jobs to do. So, uh, yeah, we all be in, well. We'll see some people in a couple of weeks' time and hopefully talk to you next weekend on the talk group. I'll say 73s and uh, leave it with you, Colin. Yeah, 73s all and uh, catch you all in a fortnight's time. 73s. 